This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Charcoal Book Club. Their carefully curated selection reflects the best in contemporary photography and all for a reasonable price. And they are delivered directly to your doorstep each month. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. It's a great way to begin or expand your photo library. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today and remember to use the code the candid frame at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. We also have the support of Frames Magazine. It's a quarterly publication that showcases the work of many of the best in contemporary photography, including Steve McCurry, Martin Parr, and Amy Vitale. Each issue is beautifully printed and thoughtfully curated by its editors. It's a wonderful way to discover and be inspired by great photography. Subscribe today and use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME to enjoy a 10% discount on your monthly and yearly subscription when you visit readframes.com forward slash join. Working on a personal project that revolves around family can be both challenging and gratifying. The question of access is often the number one consideration, and surprisingly, it's sometimes easier to gain the cooperation of strangers than it is your own family, but it all revolves around a spirit of trust. That familiarity and insight allows you to create images unlike what an outsider would create. Most importantly, it provides a way to look at your family, yourself, and your personal history differently. Korean photographer Kyung Jun Yang has been documenting and exploring his relationship with his own father in his Men Don't Cry project. The project resulted in a very intimate relationship with a parent who has grown increasingly emotional and vulnerable as he ages. Kyung has slowly gained an understanding of his father beyond his use of alcohol and understands how his father's childhood trauma shaped him into the man and the father that he is. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Thank you for, for doing this. And, uh, oh, I'm honored. Yeah, yeah, I've enjoyed discovering your, your work. I want you to tell me a little more about your upbringing and what led you to come to the States, especially to study photojournalism uh, in Texas. Uh, it's a long story. So it's not, at first it's not really to photojournalism. So I went to the States when I was in high school in junior year. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a basketball coach. It's totally different. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, right. So my dream has been NBA coach since I was in middle school. And then I chased that dream. I chased that dream for 10 years and I quit that dream when I was in junior in college. And I had some depression issues, and photo photography was outlet for me. And then that led me to study photojournalism. There were two choices: I could choose fine art photo or documentary or photojournalism. Okay. And I didn't have any art background, and I took some communication and journalism classes because I like to read articles and and stuff. So. I chose photojournalism, and I'm here. <laughs> well, ten years is a is a long time to sort of dedicate to to making a particular career happen. What obstacles did you face, and you know, what was kind of the determining factor in you making a change? I mean, from from you know wanting to be a basketball coach, coach yeah. Mm, first, money, and I didn't really have athleticism as other athletes in college mm -hmm. so I didn't really have like athlete experience so I played basketball in high school but it was like division three and I coached at youth camp basketball, uh, basketball youth camp and elementary school but it didn't really let me t lead me to to become an NBA coach it wasn't even close I think I just I was I kept lying myself I kept lying myself that I've been chasing my dream, but in reality, I didn't really do anything. So after 10 years, I realized that 
I had been lying to myself that I was chasing my dream, but actually I didn't really do much. So it took a while to realize that I was lying to myself, but at the end I had to face it because after college, I have to make money. Mm-hmm. Like I have to earn money for myself like to, to live. So I think I just opened my eyes to the reality that like basketball coach cannot be a job or dream that I can do for a living. So yeah, yeah, I understand. What, what? But what was it about the idea of becoming a basketball coach? What was oh. it that what? What was the allure? Because yeah, it could could or couldn't have been a job, but there there was something about it that made you feel a certain way mm. when you thought about it and what do you think that was i think i thought i had leadership and i always like to see myself in third per- third perspective and in reality i didn't really have athleticism to be an nba player or even korean professional to play in Korea, korean professional league that was one of the reasons i think it was the main reason i think I should be a coach if I can be a athlete. And there are different jobs as like manager or athletic coach. Mm-hmm. It's not like NBA coach, but like performance coach. But I always like to teach kids and I believe that I had leadership. So that's one of, that, that was why I wanted to be a coach. When you were coaching the kids, mm-hmm. how did that make you feel? I know you said you liked it, but was there something in particular that you that really was satisfying? It was really magical. I worked eight to ten hours a day. I wasn't even tired after that. Wow. Like, I, I, really, I really thought this would be my dream. This would be my future job. I really enjoyed it. Like, also, I didn't really get much pay because I was like intern. But even though I didn't get money, even though I worked eight to ten hours a day, I was really happy every day. That sometimes is the case when you're doing something you love. You don't get mm-hmm. paid very much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> the photographers know that all too well. Um, <laughs> so you decide to study photography in, in uh, Austin. Tell, yes. tell me about that transition, because that's, that's a pretty abrupt transition. Yeah, the reason I chose Austin, like the University of Texas at Austin, was also basketball, because it's known for great basketball team and great uh, academic system. So that's what I... That's why I chose Texas Austin, but luckily they had one of the best journalism uh, professors in college in the university. So I was really lucky to meet Eli Reed and other professors that who taught me basics of uh, photojournalism. What, what was one of the bigger challenges that you faced when you first started out? Because yeah, you were kind of new to photography, but were there mm-hmm. other challenges that were pronounced for you? So skill-wise, I think I kind of practiced by myself. I mean, they taught students certain skills they need to have to take photos. But at the end, it's all you. If you really dedicate it, if you're really dedicated, I think students study themselves. So skill-wise, I think I learned myself. In terms of difficulty, was it? Oh, difficulty. Yeah, was it? Was it? You know, cultural differences. You know, Austin Austin is famously not considered Texas, Texas. Mm-hmm. It is in Texas, but yeah. it's it's so it's different. I, but you know, yeah. nevertheless, you you're going to a part of the country that is very different from any other mm-hmm. any other place in the country. And in terms of just socialization, you may have challenges in terms of getting to know people especially as a as a photojournalist where you're called to sort of engage and meet strangers gain their confidence make their photographs and then you being originally from you know south korea and all of that even though you had been you know living in the united states since you were young there's still differences there and i'm wondering Mm -hmm. whether all of those things if and how it made your new career path challenging so cultural wise it was better than south korea to take photos because people are much more open 
in the States, it's easier to ask for an interview. But mm -hmm. for me, individually, I'm a very introvert person. So photojournalism about always asking interviews and always asking photos, like asking the context and like always need to talk to someone to take photos when you do photojournalism, right? Yes. So it was really, it, it was really difficult and it's still difficult for me to meet strangers and talk to strangers. There was one project that you worked on called Metamorphosis, mm -hmm. which was with the young woman you were in a relationship with. Tell me about that project, because it's a very intimate, it's a very powerful um, mm -hmm. project that I think is very, really fascinating. Tell me about how that came about. When I see, when I take photos of someone, I see someone and I see, how do I say, I see it through me. I you see, see yourself through her. Yeah. Yeah, I see myself through the person. And at that time, Asian racism, Asian hate was really strong. Mm -hmm. How do I say? Yeah, strong. Yeah. In the States. So I wanted to make photo series, series about racism, but not directly. I wanted to like, use my own language and talk about the, the racism that influenced someone who's from Asian country. So she's from China. She moved to the States when she was very young. And the series about her changes influenced by people and social pressures in the States to her. And when I take photos, I also see myself through those photos too. Yeah, I. you, you have a variety of photographs uh, of her in which she just f feels like so out of place, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. so disconnected <clears throat> from everything. And that one of the only places she felt any sort of comfort is when she would go to Chinatown where she was surrounded with immigrants mm -hmm. because otherwise she felt so separate that issues with her body, like the folds of her eyes, mm -hmm. um, became things that she came to dislike about herself. And that that's that's a, there's a lot of internal stuff that's happening, mm. and the challenge for a photographer is how to make photographs that sort of convey that. Yeah, I, I think you effectively did that, but it's nevertheless a challenge. How did you come to sort of f figure out how to do that? I talk a lot with her, and. I didn't just talk, but like we are, I did like one or two interviews a week and I, I wrote down her mm -hmm. interviews. And then I actually drew picture from the interviews. Like there's a photo she laid down on the bed. Like I actually had it in my mind and there's like total neck. There's a photo that sh shows her neck is like tilt a little bit like this right it, yeah yeah i also drew a picture before i take those photos too so it was like half is coincidence half is made by me so the first the first thing was i needed i needed to know her much more than just knowing her habit or hobby i needed i needed to like i need to feel like I'm her. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so after that, I drew the pictures. And then whenever I see her, I always like so focused like what, what's going to happen to her? Like what's going to, like what kind of photos can I take during uh, ordinary days? Oh, so you were doing both images that you had kind of conceptualized ahead of time and photographing her just as during the course of her day. So it was sort of, yeah. it was a mix of different things. Yeah. But if I didn't have the images in my mind, I wouldn't take those photos. Like I always had I images in my mind. So when things happen, if I didn't have that image in my mind, I wouldn't take those photos. That makes perfect sense because you, because you had done the interviews, because you knew her very, mm -hmm. very, in a very intimate manner you were able to sort of anticipate 
the moments and yeah. the kinds of photographs that you would be able to get, as opposed to someone who would just dive in, who doesn't know her, who knows nothing about her, and just starts making making mm -hmm. pictures. Yeah, um, I started to see her differently after the interviews, like her doing things, ordinary stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not like ordinary anymore. Like some movements could be special to me. The one who laid on the, the one photo that she's laid on the back. Yes. If I just saw that moment before, I wouldn't think anything. But after I thought, after I uh, decided the the title metamorphosis, I could see those moments as cocoon, like the caterpillar uh, laid on the bed. Right. Yeah. That's an amazing insight to have about the process, mm -hmm. right? Especially with respect to doing documentary photography because it isn't so much about just getting access to someone or someone's life right it's having an mm -hmm. understanding of who they are uniquely beyond what kind of good photographs they can give you yeah. right it's it really calls on you to to be sensitive and have a degree of of empathy because mm -hmm. I think that informs the photographs, and that really comes, that really comes across in those images. At the time, did you feel that it was a significant breakthrough for you as a photographer? Mm -hmm. Yes, because at that time I was I was still in college. I was still taking classes, photojournalism classes. But my photos, like when I took when I did some assignments, taking photos of parade or like. Like portraits mm -hmm. or taking photos for interviews, like my photos look very similar to other students. I always wanted to be different. Yeah. Also, professors usually teach students that students to be third perspective, like not not to like they teach students not too close to the subject. Don't right. feel too much empathy. They teach, but I want I want I kind of wanted to break it, and I wanted to make it different. So I wanted to show them this is also documentary, but right. also put my empathy and my uh, first perspective here too. So I was asking them, is this a documentary or not? And I don't think they didn't really like my like the series. Mm -hmm. Because it's not documentary, but in fine art perspective, they like that work. Yeah, because like think... photojournalism wise, it's not really a good photojournalism. Photo right. Yeah, because there's just like this thing about uh, objectivity, which I don't think is is I guess good in theory, but it isn't really practical because everybody brings their mm -hmm. their biases, conscious and both unconscious, to how they see things and how they photograph them. It's just it's just a part of being being human. And while there certainly have been great photographs that have been made in the tradition of photojournalism, um, for me, the, the, the images that move past that idea of not being engaged with the subject, mm -hmm. when that's kind of put aside and the photographer is, it creates very different photographs. You know, I think I think about Mary Ellen Mark, who was a wonderful documentary photographer, but she was also a photojournalist. You know, she was also a portrait photographer, and the reason why her work lasts and has so much significance is because she had compassion for her subjects. It was it wasn't just empathy; she had compassion for them. Mm, I so I think that that is what informed her and the work of other really great photographers of that of, of that genre. And I see that in your in that project of yours is that you have a lot of compassion for her and that it isn't necessarily corrupting what her story is. Like you're seeing yourself to, yeah. you're seeing yourself reflected in her but you're not letting it become just your story. It's still mm. her story. Mm. And I like I took those photos, but I didn't put my story in this in the series. Mm -hmm. so. so, 
you returned to South Korea, mm -hmm. and the, the project that turned me on to you and your work was the one that you're doing focusing on your dad called Men, Men Don't Cry. Yeah. Tell me about the beginning of that that project and why you why you decided to start making those images. Mm, I think it was shock shocking to me to see my dad crying because in Korean society masculinity is really important. Like man makes money, woman do chores at, at home mm -hmm. was traditional uh, thought of them, but it is changing. And I think it's really healthier for society. But in my dad's perspective, crying is really shame. Like crying in front of me, crying in front of my mom mm -hmm. is really shame. So after I saw him crying, I started to realize I can connect this to society, which is the decreasing of masculinity in South Korea. Mm -hmm. And I did a similar process uh, with like the metamorphosis. I did interviews with my dad for three years, and then I started to make photos uh, based on the interviews. The first time you saw your dad cry, what was he crying about? Do you know? Mm, he wanted to. He wanted to kill himself. Like he was in unstable mental mental health. Mm -hmm. So he told me he wanted to crush himself in a car accident, and then that was really shocking to me because he didn't really talk about any mental like any weakness to me before, and then suddenly he told me he wanted to die so i just thought i didn't want i wanted to talk to him about yeah. it but i didn't really have good relationship with my dad so <laughs> yeah so photography taking photos with my dad really uh, gave me some time to talk with my talk to my dad yeah like i could make an excuse to have a time that i can say to my dad in this interview so we talk just for two three hours and it kind of helped us to bond a little bit more than before man i envy you i really do oh. i my dad was kind of very similar to yours in terms of coming up and not being real generous with his emotions he he demonstrated his love for his family by how hard he worked you know he didn't okay. come he didn't come and start talking about his feelings and I remember the first time I heard him cry and his father had died and he got the call and it was like the middle of the night and I was in bed and I remember him walking down the hall with my mom sobbing and I remember how scared I was in that moment hearing him cry because yeah. um, it was like you it was it was a shock but I had been so used to him as sort of this stoic person that to see him cry was something I just couldn't understand and the thought of it terrified me even even until the day he died I think I only saw him cry three maybe four times I know he carried a lot of sorrow in him mm -hmm. but in terms of him like really just like blubbering crying man it was very very <laughs> rare um mm -hmm. and it was difficult for us to have a conversation because the last time i saw him uh alive he right he, he take he had taken a trip to the dominican republic mm -hmm. and the, i was visiting him and what we usually would do is i would visit him we would small talk and we'd watch a television show together and he was in his bedroom watching a TV show, and I brought up the fact that, oh, I wish we could talk more because I kind of would like to be able to have a you know conversation with you. And he didn't say anything, you know, and I understood that it, for him, it was it was difficult for him to be able to do it. He didn't learn how to how to do it. So when I hear that you that your dad was willing to have that conversation, I'm so glad for you and him 
that you guys could do that. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing. You know, the work kind of reflects that intimacy and that compassion that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Your your dad had a difficult upbringing. He was born an orphan, yeah. which is frowned upon uh, in South Korea, but there are a lot of other circumstances that made life difficult for him before he became uh, an adult. Can you share that? Share that with us. Mm, sure. So his dad died when he was six, and then his mom left when he was six. Like after his dad died, so he didn't have parents. I mean, his mom is still alive, but. He uh, he never told me that he had mom when uh, when I was before uh, like he told me he had mom when I was twenty. Oh, so wow. he didn't he didn't share those stuff like any he didn't try to show. I mean he my English That's he okay. <laughs> he didn't show any weakness to me and and back then. It was, you. It was uh, usual to. It was not weird. People see orphan, like discriminate. How do I say? So they would discriminate against people who were or- orphans. Yes, and it was accepted by society somehow. And my dad always wanted to always like had to defend himself because nobody took care of him. Mm-hmm. So he was always, he fought a lot with people before he met my mom. And then after he had a family, he kind of kind of wanted to do stuff that he wanted to, he wanted to do with his dad, which was going to a uh, public bath. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's Asian culture that men, women, like men, like sons and dad, go to public bath together when they're young. Oh, also, they were just bad teachers who make fun of my dad because he didn't have parents. And he went to middle school and elementary school. So he always, he didn't really tell me his childhood memories. I think I, I think he wanted to erase those memories. After he had family, you know, because he didn't have parents, he didn't have any heritage from their parents, his parents. Mm-hmm. Right. So he had to work hard to make money to buy a house because he always wanted to have a stable family. So he was so focused on making money and buy a house. So we had less time to talk to him because he worked hard and it went on and on. So just to get a, a better understanding, the, the issue of, of being an orphan in terms of the culture, why they were why they were looked down upon, was because of the lack of heritage. They didn't have a name. They weren't part of a, a lineage in terms of family. Is that why they were sort of ostracized? Why they were looked down on, or was it something else? I think there is culture that you learn uh, to be polite from their parents, like. You, oh, okay. You learn the attitude from their parents in Korea, but he didn't have parents, so they just naturally thought he doesn't learn. He didn't learn anything. He did. He doesn't have attitude, good attitude. Mm. Like they assume that he's a bad kid because he didn't have parents. Right? Oh, oh my God, that must have been incredibly painful to him. Yeah, but oh. he didn't really talk about it. Yeah. And it, yeah, and, and as a kid, who do you turn to to talk about that? If your peers and the adults are have already judged you, who do you go to to say, I'm not that, that I'm scared, that I'm hurt? You have nobody, so you just sort of keep it to yourself. <clears throat> oh, my God, your dad went through, you know, that's... There's one photo that is called Raise Your Hand mm-hmm. in the Menton Cry series. So the teacher didn't really have that, uh, didn't really care that he would be, he would feel shame to let their, let his friends know that he doesn't have parents because the teacher asked 
the whole students, like, raise your hand if you don't have mom, raise your hand if you don't have dad, raise your hand if you don't have refrigerator, something like that. They mm -hmm. just, the teachers, they, they in front of students, and my dad had to raise his hand. So his friends knew, had to, like, know that he doesn't have parents. Mm -hmm. So they kind of, they started to make fun of him. So when you started interviewing him and, mm -hmm. and making making the photographs, considering how, <clears throat> one, he is your dad, and even though you may not have had sort of the most engaging relationship with him at the time, it's it, it, it creates its own set of complications in terms of making photographs. I can imagine that was difficult. It was really difficult because... I mean, he still doesn't really talk about it, but he, we drank a lot. Like he, he only talks when he drinks alcohol. Mm -hmm. At first, I, it wasn't really an interview. I just sat there and he drank and he talks and I listened to it. Mm -hmm. And after it gets more comfortable and comfortable and we could talk without alcohol. And then uh. I could write the interviews. And I think he, kind of like that I wasn't interested in, in his life because before nobody didn't really care about his life, I think. And he didn't ask me to show the photos, but he really enjoyed talking to me about his life, even though it was kind of painful to him. Mm -hmm. I think he, at some point, he enjoyed talking about his scars and kind of made it, the interview kind of made him cured. Right, yeah. A little bit, yeah. It was really difficult, and it is still difficult to talk to him, but and I, we just kept trying and trying, yeah. It, tell me about the creation of the photographs. How, how different was it from what you had done in Metamorphosis? Hmm. Since I didn't uh, have time to be with him as much as Metamorphosis series, so I was in Seoul. I went to Jinhae, which is the hometown, uh, once or twice a year. No, like two, three, four photos, f four to five times a year. So for the Metamorphosis series, I took the old, like half of them are ordinary days. I, half of them are candid photos. Yes. But Men Don't Cry, they're like 90% made in my head first with the interviews. And then I find the references. And whenever I, whenever I went to the hometown, I took the photos. It was like more like made photos than candid photos. Mm -hmm. Inspired by a close friend, I've returned to practicing the old art of letter writing. Every couple of weeks, I sit down with a pen and a pad of paper and write my thoughts and memories in cursive, the cursive I honed after 12 years of Catholic school. I then put it in an envelope with a stamp and drop it in the mailbox. When I receive a letter, there is something special about unfolding the paper and reading what was written down for me. There is a wonderful beauty and intimacy that exists there. It's the same feeling I have when it comes to the photography books I order and receive. The pages of photographs in those books are a dialogue between me and the photographer. It provides an experience that can't be simulated when looking at those same images on a computer or a smartphone screen. You know what I'm talking about, even if you own just one monograph that has been and continues to be a source of inspiration for you. When I encourage you to become a member of the Charcoal Book Club, I want you to do more than just buy a book. I want to encourage you to enjoy a special experience with a unique and talented photographer each month because that's what you get with your membership. That's why I'm such a fan and supporter of the Charcoal Book Club. They help photographers get their books into the hands of people who will enjoy and treasure their work. There is no better source of inspiration than a bookshelf with exceptional and quality work. I believe you should become a Charcoal Book Club member today. With your membership, you receive a quality monograph each month. Each of these has been carefully curated and selected. 
The books reflect the diversity of genres, photographers, and styles, all of which you will appreciate and enjoy. And if you don't like that month's release, you can choose an alternative book of equal value in their catalog. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. Sign up today and use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout to enjoy 10% off your first membership payment. And Frames Magazine is another wonderful photographic resource. This quarterly magazine showcases exceptional photography reproduced using high-quality paper and inks. Each issue is a wonderful piece of art unto itself. The magazine has showcased the work of great photographers like Martin Parr and Amy Vitale, and they also provide additional resources and content online that you can enjoy between issues. Enjoy what they have to offer by subscribing today and use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME to enjoy a 10% discount on your monthly and yearly subscription when you visit readframes.com forward slash join. And we can also do with your support here on the Candid Frame by you becoming a Patreon supporter. You can contribute $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the Candid Frame. Though we'd love for you to be a longtime supporter, your commitment for just three to six months would be helpful. Please consider doing it today. And thank you so much for all your support. Your mom isn't in the in the photographs, but her presence is there. Tell me about that dynamic in terms of what was your what is your mom thinking? when she sees what you're you're doing <laughs> i think she she just told me that she looked too old when she saw <laughs> the photo <laughs> and i think she cried when she saw all the series i think but mom was also the reason that my dad felt pain too mm -hmm. there are other stories that i couldn't put in this series so uh, we didn't really talk about the series because it's kind of it kind of hard hard to yeah when she saw the photos because yeah there were some moments that she hurt my dad too yeah there's one photograph where you're it's a beautiful photograph of your dad sitting shirtless in bed and you're taking it through the doorway and he mm. just seems so lonely and small there and the, in the text it's it's he he states the quote is that he feels that your mom his wife is colder to him because he's mm. no longer working for whatever reason yes. and for a man who has who has made his almost his entire identity his work and providing for his family i can only imagine how devastating that that is yes. how true it was in terms of your mom's attitude I think is kind of a, sort of a moot point because I suspect that the the greater grief is how he thought about himself in in that in that yeah. in that moment. I think that photo is only the candid photos that I took. He was not short list though. <laughs> ah. Yeah, he was very drunk and he was crying and he was sitting on the sofa. Uh, after talk to me that my mom is very cold to him because he doesn't make money anymore. And I think my mom was crying at the time. No, not crying, sleeping at the time. But the reason I took, took those photos is like he looked, he looked like he was in an island by himself. Yeah. And if you see the photo closely, the, my dog is leaving him too. Even my dog is leaving him too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I was like, I need to take these photos. A, a lot of people are hesitant to make these kinds of photographs that are so vulnerable and so intimate and to share them, right? Why is it important that you do? I think love language to me and my dad, like taking photos of him mm -hmm. is saying the same as like taking photos of, of his vulnerable, vulnerable moments the same is, I love his vulnerable moments. I love you, even though you're so vulnerable. 
I take this photo because I love you. Mm. But I don't really say that. But the reason that I can take those photos and show it to the world is not, I'm not ashamed of him not mm-hmm. having a job. I'm always proud of my dad. That is why I'm not hesitant to take those photos. Even if, even if he seems vulnerable and weak, he's still my dad. I really love him. And I'm so proud of him. So it is okay. Everybody thinks he's, every, even it's okay. Even my mom thinks he's, like useless, it's okay because I love you. Even though you don't make money, it doesn't matter. I think this taking photos is, yeah, si- similar to that. I love my dad. Yeah, you mentioned his drinking and his depression. So his inability to, to work tied to to that. He started drinking much more after he quit the job, but. He didn't quit the job because of drinking. Okay. So it happened afterwards. Yeah, afterwards. You mentioned your own depression when you were back in the States, when you had to sort of give up on this idea of being a a coach. When you see your dad's depression, does it give you an insight into your own previous depression at all? Or does it help you understand the depression your dad is experiencing. Yeah, totally understand because whenever I see my dad at that time, as I told you, he, I, I always thought like he is in no man island. And I felt that when I was in the States too, I didn't have anyone to lean on. And then when I gave up that job, mm-hmm. I, kept, I gave up that dream. In the States, I didn't have anyone to talk to talk about it. And I think my dad is similar to the situation too. Even though I'm here and my mom's there, he can't really talk about it. So we both feel like we're in the island. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about my relationship with other men. Mm. And I'm lucky that now in my life that I have men in my life that I can talk to about my feelings. Mm. So I don't hesitate and say, I love you. And who can you say that in kind to me? But that's not something that I grew up with. Mm. It's not something that I learned. It really took me uh, a long time to be willing to do that and to be in a loving relationship with another man, not romantically, but be in an, a, a close, open relationship with, a, with another man because I think that, uh, uh, another man can is the only person who can understand yeah. and that you can communicate with when it comes to some of the things that we experience. Mm-hmm. You know, I can totally share agree. stuff with my wife. I can share other stuff with, you know, other women who have been in my, in, in my, in my life. But, you know, there's something special about that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, really but I'm in a culture where that's, where though difficult, it can happen. Right, as you mentioned in South Korea, y- y- the guys may go to a bathhouse together, but they're not necessarily there going there to talk about feelings. They'll be talking there about politics, about business, about mm-hmm. you know. So for you, you know, having had the experience of living both in the states and in South Korea, in terms of your needs to be able to talk. Mm-hmm. about your feelings how 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 was how are you how are you navigating all that now to be honest it's just all mixed like when i talk to my parents when i go to my hometown yeah i think i go back to my childhood self but when i'm in seoul yeah like people are kind of more open than in my hometown my hometown is like more traditional right like the gender roles or like men makes money, women do chores. Mm-hmm. Like the gender was more distinct in the in my hometown, but it's changed. It's changed a lot, but still. But in so it's really different. So I think I have many serves serves that when I talk to certain people, I'm more open. Mm-hmm. When I talk to certain people, I don't really talk about myself. Do you find that when you're with other men of your generation, that there is more of an openness 
to talk about those things or are they still sort of like closed and reluctant to be intimate in that way? I think it's still very closed. I mean, comparing to my dad's generation, generation is much more open, mm -hmm. but still for men, South Korea society is not too, it's not easy to uh, show their weakness, I think. Yeah to their wives and to their family. Was there a, a, a hesitancy in putting the work out there, considering how the culture looks at a man in that way, that you were headed, that you were concerned that people, especially in, in, in the Korean culture, would see your, your father exhibiting all the qualities that they consider negative and bad? Even though you were not coming from that, were, were you kind of second-guessing yourself about putting the work out there? Mm, I think my work didn't really get much attention from South Korea yet. So I, I think I, I, I could see that not many male audience would like my work because it really shows Korean men's weakness too, not just my dad. But I think is healthy to just discuss about it, talk about it. Mm -hmm. Is it really bad? Is it really good? Like, I don't want, I hope people see my, the photo series as like opening to talk about mm, men's, Korean men's roles in Korea. Uh, but luckily when people from other countries saw my work, they really, they, they told me they felt empathy and compassion a lot. Yeah. Uh, like, even though they're from very different culture, they could see their dad through my dad. Oh, yeah. I, I certainly felt yeah. that. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that photographer be and why? Do you know Brian Stut Stumat? I don't know how to pronounce his name, the last name. Uh, you Brian Stumat, I think. So my works are usually based on story and very personal to me. So I always admire people who take great photos of uh, stranger who is not related to mm -hmm. them and his works is very 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 beautiful and when i see those photos i don't really think about anything i mean those photos have stories too yeah. but it's so beautiful and i just stop for i said i forgetting the stories and just enjoy the photos and that's really different from my photos i really so that's why i really admire yeah Thank you for the recommendation and thanks for making the time to talk about your work. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really touched and moved by what you're doing. Thank and, you so much. And uh, keep, keep going. Keep going. I think that you are uh, a, a unique voice and I look forward to seeing what you create in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks to Kyung for joining us. Find out more about Kyung and his work by visiting kyungjunyang.com. And if you're a fan of our work, you can write a review on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And remember to use the hashtag TheCandidFrame. You can also support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. I'll be conducting another workshop soon in Japan, this time in the cities of Kyoto and Osaka. My first time in the country about three to four years ago was amazing, and I look forward to sharing my experience with a few photographers. To find out more, please visit the website or go to nobechicreative.com. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor. 
who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibadian X, and this is The Candid Frame.